I'm about to propose a crazy idea, but I think the more I explain it, the less crazy it'll be. What if the brain doesn't produce consciousness, but rather it edits it? or experiences it. Welcome back to Everything We Know Is A Lie, part three, where we will be looking into the neuroscience and psychology of reality, perception, and consciousness. I've been super excited to get to this part because this is where my field of expertise is. So we're gonna be getting into the nitty gritty. But once again, disclaimer, this is just an evaluation of my research. You don't have to believe me. I'm not saying that everything that I'm saying is complete truth. I am just making educated best guesses. The point that I hope I am accurately getting across to you guys by this point is that all of our best theories and hypotheses are still in and of themselves best guesses. So essentially we're going to be looking at how the brain produces our idea of reality, presenting what we know, what we don't know, and why consciousness itself might not be the thing that your brain produces. But to help better illustrate the points made in both the last video and this video, we're going to recap on how our senses actually are not giving us the whole picture. So we know that all expressions of color are just different wavelengths, but I'm going to be breaking down both the visual and auditory pathways in the brain to help us understand how the brain starts to piece this sensory input together. So essentially when light hits the retina, photoreceptors in the back of the eye then convert that information into electrical impulses. These signals travel from the optic nerve through to the optic chiasm and then to the thalamus and then to the primary visual cortex. Now this primary primary visual cortex is just one of 15 or more steps or visual areas or cortices that are all specialized to essentially add different elements of what you are seeing together to create the picture. So you've got areas for shape, motion, color, edges, depth, and as such, only about 5-10% to 10 of what you actually see comes from raw data. The other 95% is just prediction, memory, expectations, and context. So vision isn't a camera, it's a best guess. Similarly with the auditory pathway, sound waves travel through the ear, creating mechanical vibrations in the cochlea, which then translates into neural signals. These signals then travel through the brainstem to the thalamus, and then finally to the auditory cortex, which as you can imagine has a similar layout to the visual cortex, in the sense that there are multiple steps or stages to creating meaning. So essentially meaning comes last, not first. So the takeaway I want you guys to have from this is that nothing enters the brain as a picture or a sound. Everything arrives as meaningless electrical signals. The meaning is then created internally. And if perception is created internally, the question becomes who is constructing this internal reality? Which leads us to the default mode network. Now, if you know me from TikTok, I talk a lot about this because the default mode network is essentially the seat of the self. This network, made up of multiple different regions of the brain, is active when your mind is wandering, when you're thinking about yourself, or when you're thinking about future slash past events. It is the part of your brain that creates an identity narrative, or the part of your brain that tells you, I am this type of person. However, it's also strongly linked to anxiety, rumination, and depression. People with depression tend to spend a longer time within the default mode network. It is also, as you can guess, very highly active in people with a lot of self-referential thinking. And what's interesting is that psychedelics actually tune down the default mode network, which is what leads to this ego dissolution, which is something else I will be talking about on this channel. So essentially the default mode network is your brain's narrator. It is the part of you that is currently listening to what I'm saying and referencing it based on your past experiences. And it doesn't just process information, it tells you who you are. But nature also likes balance. And similarly to how every yin has its yang, the default mode network has the central executive network. The central executive network, or CEN, is essentially the focus network. It handles things like problem solving and working memory, and is responsible for what we know of as the flow state. Now the CEN has an inverse relationship with the DMN, or the default mode network, whereby when the default mode network is active, the central executive network is quiet. But if the brain creates the self, but the brain has no single location for consciousness, then what is consciousness? And why do scientists who spend so much time looking at the brain still have a hard time describing it? Well, that leads us into David Chalmers' hard problem of consciousness. And I'm going to break this one down for you guys in an analogy. Imagine there's a colorblind woman named Mary. Now, Mary cannot see the color red, and that kind of drives her a little bit crazy. So she ends up spending the rest of her life dedicated to trying to understand the color and the experience of it. She gets a PhD in physics, a PhD in neuroscience. She can tell you absolutely everything about the color of red, including its wavelength, right down to the areas of the brain that light up in different people when experiencing the color red. 
but she will never have the same qualitative experience of that color as someone who can see the color red. This is the idea of qualia, which was also talked about by the ancient Greek philosophers. Refer back to part one if you want to know more about that. But essentially, the psychologist David Chalmers looked at this and was like, what is going on here? Why is it necessary that the brain produces a intangible, unexplainable inner experience rather than just computation? Like, there is no physical law that explains the taste of chocolate, the color blue, or the feeling of your first heartbreak. The heart problem is literally the mystery of being. Now this leads us into the current theories on consciousness, and I'm going to be presenting you with both their strengths and their weaknesses, because even the strongest theories have their limitations. The first one is global workspace theory. This proposes that consciousness is like an information broadcast amongst multiple regions of the brain, kind of like a spotlight illuminating certain thoughts. The strengths of this is that it explains things like decision making and attention, but my personal caveat with it is that it proposes that consciousness is emergent from matter. Global workspace theory explains the access to information well, but not necessarily the feeling of experience. The second and my personal favorite is integrated information theory. This proposes that consciousness or the level of consciousness of a being is related to the amount of information that that being system can integrate at any point in time. They propose a mathematical value or phi that can measure these levels or states of consciousness. This theory kind of starts to lend itself to things like panpsychism and cosmopsychism, which we will be getting into more once we talk about like religion and spirituality and stuff. However, the strengths of it is that it is mathematically grounded, but the weaknesses is that there have been arguments that the mathematical grounding is not necessarily coherent or suggesting that the mathematical value of phi isn't actually measuring what they think it's measuring. We also have recurrent processing theory, which proposes that consciousness is essentially just feedback loops in the visual cortex, which would explain early visual awareness, but fails to explain emotions or selfhood. And then we have higher order theories. These theories propose that consciousness is essentially metacognition or thinking about your thoughts. For example, if you're seeing somebody walk down the street in an outfit that you wouldn't necessarily wear and then you make a judgment on them, but then there's that voice in your head that corrects that judgment and it's like, oh, that's not very nice. That under these theories would be consciousness. But the problem with this is that it lends itself to infinite regression or where you get to the point where you're asking, well, who is aware of that awareness? And then five, and I'm just gonna be lumping these all in together, physicalist theories. Many, if not most mainstream theories of consciousness pretty plainly state that the brain is the producer of consciousness, that consciousness is emergent from the brain. But this is where things get weird because some recent data is starting to challenge the idea that the brain is actually the producer of consciousness at all. Now, one of the neuroscientists who really got me into this whole train of thought, because I do want to preface this by saying I was entirely a physicalist before I started learning about this stuff, was Majori Willicott, who, by the way, was also a physicalist for the better part of her career. She is a neurocognitive scientist who has produced many, many, many notable works in the neuroscience space. And she talks a lot about how she too used to be a physicalist until she started noticing some things that weren't currently explainable under a physicalist perspective. And one of those things was near-death experiences or the reported experiences people have after dying and being brought back. Now, once again, this information is coming from studies. I will link them all in the description along with everything else that we've talked about so far. But essentially, in her studies, she analyzed a series of verified near-death experiences, with some examples being subjects having experiences during cardiac arrest and even during EEG flatlines, which mean no brain activity. And yet, despite showing no brain activity, subjects reported perception of their surroundings, out-of-body observation of what was actually happening during the surgery, not only giving accurate descriptions of medical procedures, but verifiable details of things that were both said and done by nurses and doctors and surgeons in that room while that patient was technically dead. And most importantly, most of these people recall having this experience of overwhelming peace and love despite what was happening. Now, whether or not these actually prove that consciousness exists independently of the brain, I don't know. And I'm not claiming to know. I'm just putting pieces together. But at the very minimum, they are challenging the idea that the brain is the producer of consciousness. Now, this is just one of many such studies. I will be putting them all in the description below for you to check out if you're interested. But the point I want to make is that if the brain is the generator of consciousness, these experiences shouldn't happen. But if the brain were the filter of consciousness, they actually make perfect sense. But anywho, 
Today, we've looked at how the brain constructs reality, how the default mode network constructs the self, how consciousness still defies an explanation, and why some evidence is starting to challenge the brain as a generator model. Next time, we're going to be switching over to quantum physics, specifically looking into quantum information theory, to draw parallels between what some physicists are starting to say, which sounds a lot like what I've just said. But anyways, I will see you guys next time, and I love you guys.